Hi everyone. Did you ever want to hit the blues trail? You know, go to the heart of the Delta of Mississippi? Or maybe sell your soul to the devil at the crossroads? Well, I want a small grant to enhance my Roots of American Music, Blues and Beyond Honors course. So my wife and I did a 2,700 mile, two week road trip to see for ourselves and to answer some of the questions I've had about Delta and Deep South Blues. They can only be answered by seeing for ourselves the juke joints, the blues clubs, the musicians, the museums, the railroads, the levees, and the cotton fields that produced America's most beloved and homegrown authentic music. First stop was the Allman Brothers Big House in Macon. The exhibit progressed chronologically from the Allman Joyce and Hourglass throughout their illustrious career with videos of live shows, life-size photos, elegant paintings, and tons of memorabilia. Now, I was lucky enough to see the Allman Brothers with Duane and Barry, and nearly every year since. The guitars, clothing, and Greg's Hammond B3 organ were prominent, as were their collection of significant guitars, basses, drums, amps, speakers, and clothing. And look at Dickie Betts' beautiful Gibson. And by the way, the Allman Brothers were instrumental in helping Jimmy Carter run successfully for governor and later for president. Upstairs were the living quarters with practice rigs, family photos, and even a saddle that Barry and his wife put in for their daughter. In particular, I love the artwork from the poster arrangements to these beautiful paintings. If you love the Allman Brothers, this is sacred territory. Afterwards, we stopped in at Capricorn Studios, where they, Wet Willie, Otis Redding, and many others recorded. The studio was being used that day, but the digital library upstairs really showed how influential Phil Walden and Capricorn Records were in promoting Southern Rock. And how often do you get to play on Otis Redding's piano? Now on to Hotlanta, a hotbed of blues activity. <laughs> journey, we love the hundreds of photographs and murals of blues artists, local, regional, and national. And darned if Fat Matt's ribs weren't the best we've ever eaten. And we got a live show, too. <laughs> Elvis lived in Tupelo until age 13. The park had his original house and chapel, plus a 15-minute video on how he absorbed the gospel, country, blues, and folk music from the area. Of course, everyone sang in church, but they also stopped in the sharecroppers and tenant farmers' porches on their way home from school 
to listen to the old timers. There was a museum there and plenty of posters from his albums and films, which a lot of young ladies seemed to love. When the cotton crop was mechanized, that threw a lot of people out of work and his dad moved the family to Memphis in their Plymouth. There's a lot to research in Memphis, starting with these gorgeous statues at the Welcome Center, and then progressing to Beale Street, which was a vibrant black commercial district for decades. Start at the Blue City Cafe for some good food and a live show, and enjoy all the free live music down the street. A lot of this music was played on WDIA, the nation's first black-owned radio station. And where did they get this music from? At our first stop, Stax Records of Soulsville. It was created by Jim Stewart and Estelle Axton, and their displays started with a recreation of the local church, where all singing careers started. By the way, Elvis's biggest selling album remains How Great Thou Art, with the hit gospel tune, Peace in the Valley, which he sang throughout his life. Aretha's father was a prominent preacher. Al Green divided his time between soul music and gospel. And John Lee Hooker's mother never forgave him for leaving gospel for the devil's music. But with Rufus Thomas and his daughter Carla, the integrated Memphis Horns, the songwriting team of Dave Porter, and the prolific Isaac Hayes, also the rising star of Otis Redding, a group called the Soul Sisters, and many others, Stax Records helped integrate Memphis, which at the time was one of the most segregated cities of the era. But the newly emerging blues-based rock and soul genres were helped by, again, WDIA, the radio station that not only introduced this music, but allowed the community to post whatever they needed. And though this equipment seems primitive, it so beautifully captured Booker T's Hammond M3, one of the most distinctive keyboards in the world. The Mississippi-Memphis connection ran deep, especially when Dewey Phillips, a local DJ, started playing Elvis and other records. And soon enough, with the interstate highway and railroad systems, the music spread nationwide. people recorded at Stax, even folk musicians like James Taylor, Texas bluesmen, gospel groups, and for some strange reason, Rick D's Disco Duck. With the death of Otis Redding and most of his backup band, the Barquets, in a plane crash and other financial problems, Stax records closed. The crumbling building was sold to a church group for $10 and torn down several years later. But by 1999, a nonprofit group called Soulsville Foundation constructed a replica of the studios and opened the present day museum. The whole story is told in cousin Robert Gordon's book and film, Respect Yourself The Story of Stax Records, a place where you can play with the legendary Steve Cropper. Our second stop was Sun Records, where the incredible Sam Phillips wasn't all that impressed with Elvis until his secretary told him he was crazy. With the money from the sale of Elvis's contract, he developed the Millionaire Quartet and many, many others. Someday 
Our guide assured us that this was the microphone that Elvis used, and I got all shook up. But Sam's technical expertise helped him do mobile recordings, recover old masters, cut demos, and produce recordings that got played by local DJ Dewey Phillips. That allowed him to distribute a ton of music nationwide profitably and invest in a small company called Holiday Inn. And though the two-story building seemed small and tight, you couldn't help but feel the large impact of Sun Records. Of course, we had to go to B.B. King's Club, where the cover charge was only $10 for a rocking good Memphis blues show. felt the rock and soul museum was excellent. With headphones guiding you at your own pace, it answered a lot of questions about how these field hollers, call and responses, work songs, chants and stomps influenced rural blues. Turns out after hours, they all jammed on the sharecroppers' porches. If you didn't have an instrument, you grabbed a washboard or your homemade gut bucket. And this is where Ike and Tina Turner started cranking out the high-energy blues from the Southern Soul Circuit. The music was so popular, it was played over battery-operated radios, hand-cranked gramophones, and on radio stations like WHER, the nation's first all-female ownership group. The equipment captured the excitement of the local bands as they became bigger and more professional. And as always, they started touring the country. That introduced the country to Delta, Deep South, and Memphis-based blues. And does it surprise you that Elvis was a member of the speech club as listed in his high school yearbook photo? Everybody told us to try Gus's fried chicken, and with the sides of beans and mac and cheese, it was authentic Southern cuisine. Mm. Mm. Gus's fried chicken, it's the best. On our last day in Memphis, Bluesman Doug McLeod gave us a near-private concert at Red's Barbecue and Blues in nearby Coldwater, Mississippi. With James's gourmet fire pit, smokers, and Doug's funny stories and original tunes, it was an excellent night of blues. <laughs> To the stuff that you do, you look out for number one. I'm stepping in number two, and I'm gone. Little girl, you know I'm gone. Just like a fox with a chicken, I ain't sticking. I'm gone. I'm gone. Uh, and I thank you. The Memphis Music Hall of Fame Museum celebrated a lot of people in front of the cameras, but also working behind the scenes. Now, many of them had million selling songs in an integrated workplace like Booker T and the MGs and K-Star. And how can you not love a ceiling full of guitars? Elvis's uniforms and posters 
showing just how prolific these blues shows were. On Beale Street, Schwab's drugstore had displays of artifacts from Southern culture dating back 100 years. They also included hoodoo items from Africa, which has shown up in Delta and Deep South Blues. Stories about John the Conqueror, black cat bones, and chants that fascinated John Lee Hooker, among others. We were lucky to have two hours with my cousin Robert Gordon, who just won his second Grammy Award. Why and how did you decide to research the blues? It's like I say in the beginning of my first book, it came from Memphis. The Rolling Stones turned me on to the blues. When they played here in Memphis, they wanted to delay until the sun went down. They didn't know it wasn't going to cool off. And they got, um, they got uh, Furry Lewis, the blues singer, to come sit in. And then a couple years later, Furry Lewis was at my high school. And I suddenly realized he was accessible. And I went to his house and... The experience at his house was so different from my house that I wanted to understand it better. And, my under and I began to pursue the blues and also the blues culture. It wasn't just about the music, it was about the people who made the music and why their lives were different from mine. You, you can't look at music in, in a vacuum. You can, but it's not as interesting. Music is a soundtrack to a life, and you have to understand the life that goes with the music. So I have always wanted to get to, you know, to, under, to understand the music, I want, to stand, I want to understand the economics, the geography, the social circumstances. All of that imbues the music with a lot more meaning, and that's what I'm after. I, I honestly don't fear for the demise of the blues because I see, I see it constantly being regenerated and recurring. In Clarksdale, there's a young man, Chris Kingtone, Chris, Chris Tone, Kingfish, Ingram, and there's a bunch of other guys around who've picked up uh, the old sounds and uh, and put their own spin on it. I've heard blues and. Um, a friend of mine here, Al Capone, made a hip-hop record with a blues guitar. Um, so I see the blues all around us. The, the blues is an expression of, of a feeling and of a circumstance. And, and that feeling and those circumstances aren't going anywhere. So the blues, because music is a soundtrack to life, the, the blues is always going to be with us. So I'm not worried about its disappearance. So I think that to understand the blues, you have to understand that the blues is an escape. And when sharecroppers who were overworked and underpaid and mistreated, when they turned to the blues, they were seeking a release and a relief. And, and that, uh, I think, is what music and the blues in particular can, can bring to busy people today, is it's a way to open your mind, it's a way to relax your mind, it's a way to let other information and new windows and new portals open in your head. You, wanna, you don't want to be so laser focused that you're going to miss the world around you. And music and blues will help you absorb those worlds, and I encourage you to open your minds to them. And I am Robert Gordon, a writer and filmmaker, and that's just my opinion. Robert suggested we go to his favorite juke joint, Wild Bills on the edge of town. And for a $5 cover charge and a bottle from the liquor store next door, it's about as real as it gets.
take music very seriously in the Delta. We saw Walt Busby with three different groups to ensure that there's music seven days and nights a week. thought the B.B. King Museum was the most elegant museum with wood paneled walls, wide hallways, and perfectly spaced video, audio, and memorabilia displays. From his days as a cotton chopper and tractor driver, to street performer, radio DJ, his conversion to blues boy, and becoming a beloved international icon, this museum covered it all. His Rolls Royce embodies his work ethic, show up on time, be prepared, treat people fairly, and give the audience a great show with love and happiness. Don't know why I was made to wonder. I've seen the light, Lord. I felt the thunder. Someday I'll go home again, and I know they'll take me in and take it home. Baby King. This was a great tribute to a great man. Indianola was a hotbed of Delta Blues activity, chief among them the Ebony Club and many juke joints and dance halls that hosted hundreds of artists on the Southern Blues circuit. A little farther away, you'll find the Mississippi Blues trail markers in Greenwood and the famous Tallahatchie River, where Billy Joe McAllister either jumped off or threw something off the bridge, as sung by local resident Bobby Gentry. No visit would be complete without a visit to the crossroads of Highway 61 and 49 to pay tribute to Robert Johnson, one of the great names in Delta Blues. And on the way to Robert's resting place, you get a feel for how flood prone this part of the Mississippi River was and why they needed the levees, how much labor was used in their construction. I went down to the crossroads, down to beg a ride. I went down to the crossroads, down to beg a ride. Nobody seemed to know me, everybody passed me by. The Delta Blues Museum was a highlight, not just because they presented the giants of the industry, but the literally hundreds of Mississippians whose music was spread by Malaco Records of Jackson and other smaller labels. The Muddy Waters exhibit was made from actual cedar timbers from his original cabin on Stovall Road, which we'll see later. And when Clarksdale says they provide blues seven days a week, they mean it at juke joints, clubs, art galleries, historical centers, parks, and even Grandma's Pancake and Blues Kitchen. And one of the best parts was seeing our new friends night after night enjoying authentic blues shows around the town. Right. 
The Delta's heritage was further captured by the artwork in the hotels, but also huge murals around the town celebrating everyone from the old masters to the newer ones who nourished the roots of American music to keep it alive. And we noticed everyone was committed to promoting the blues trail. What I really liked was how friendly everyone was. The musicians and business people welcomed us and were as curious about us as we were of them. Even though some of the juke joints were older, the owners came out to thank us for coming. It seemed like everyone we met in and out of town had the collective vision to preserve the Delta Blues, the music that Ike Turner brought to the town the region, the U.S., and the world. Heather, what do you think my students could get out of listening to the blues? Um, well, I believe they would get to feel something that they wouldn't be able to explain. All about feelings. It's the people's music. Um, it, it connects so many different kinds of people. Um, Who are you listening to today that you could recommend to them? Kingfish. He's from Clarksdale, and he's young. I um, watched him grow up. And he's, he, I guess he's a prime example of, of what I mean. Because he grew up here, but he has his own thing. He has originals. He's made it big on Alligator Records. So he's like our little, our little star. But uh, yeah, listen to Kingfish. He'll tell you all about it. Morgan Freeman is part owner of Ground Zero, but he wasn't there that day. Now, there are many roads looping around the area, from Tunica in the north to Yazoo City in the south, and every town claims to be the birthplace of the blues. Route 7 marks one of the areas James Meredith led his famous March Against Fear protest. Cleveland marks Charlie Patton's life at Dockery Farms, while up the tracks in Tutwiler, W.C. Handy first saw an old blues man in 1903 playing at a train station using a knife for a slide guitar that led him to record Yellow Dog Blues, one of the earliest published blues songs. You'll pass Greasy Street, a historically important black commercial district, 
as well as the birthplaces of Jesse May Hemphill and Pop Staples. And few places spawn more blues songs than the Mississippi State Prison, known as Parchment Farm, where you're warned not to pick up hitchhikers. Now just south of Yazoo City is the Blue Front Cafe, known as a major stop on the southern music circuit for hundreds of solos, duos, and groups, but also for its distinctive Bentonia-style blues. Every day. Get in the bed at night, something you're trying to do that day with that good time, you get in the bed at night, it comes to your mind, you better get up and do it, because if you don't, you look at the morning, and the morning, that's all it's gone. <laughs> Duck, did you start off with gospel like everybody? No. No. I didn't. I really started off playing what they call the Big Tony style. And after that, I started doing a little thing, little stuff because the guy called Tommy Lee West that played a lot of more or less the hill country style. And I learned a few leaks from him. But I... If these walls could talk, they could tell stories about Henry Stuckey and Jack Ward, who Jimmy learned from and how they traveled around the circuit trading licks and lyrics as they played in juke joints, dance halls, and front porches. And that's how Bentonia blues, hill country blues, Delta and Piedmont styles, and many others spread locally and up to Chicago, St. Louis, Memphis, Georgia, and anywhere musicians traveled and had their records played on the air. The mechanization of the cotton trade replaced thousands of workers with one machine and millions of black families moved away. But now the area hosts a lot of hospitality and musical events all day, all night, all week long. Right next door is the Shack Up Inn, where you can stay in authentic sharecropper's shacks, even sit on the porch like the old timers did, and catch a musical show indoors or outdoors. probably wondering what a Grateful Dead flag is doing on the road to Muddy Water's home. They were one of the first bands to play Muddy's early hit, I Just Want to Make Love to You, which introduced Delta Blues to rock and roll and the world. As we went up Stovall Road to Muddy Water's house, you can see how the slave quarters and sharecropper shacks would have lined the roads very close to the fields. Now the Mississippi floodplain is deceptively beautiful, and you can easily imagine thousands of workers slaving in the fields under the brutal hot sun. Shortly after, we stood on the levees built by slaves, farmhands, indentured workers, and conscripted blacks, where a young man, McKinley Morganfield, told himself he was leaving the muddy waters of this cruel land. If we had planned it differently, we would have timed it with some of the annual festivals. On the other hand, having the Delta all to ourselves was special. One last question was answered just south of Jackson, where Robert Johnson's grandchildren run a museum in Crystal Springs, where he grew up. He was taught and nurtured by Robert Lockwood, Pine Top Perkins, Tommy Johnson, and Honey Boy Edwards, some of whom lived long lives and brought Johnson's music to hundreds of others. Did he have any legal heirs? Well, for years, Claude Johnson claimed to be his only legal son, but had no proof. His case made it all the way to the Mississippi Supreme Court. He produced his mother's best friend, who testified that she witnessed the two of them having sex that resulted in Claude's birth nine months later, and the Supreme Court ruled in his favor.
What's impressive is that every single musician we met was real. They believe that the blues is all heart, and it's the feeling you get when you play and the feelings you give to an audience when you're in the groove. So whether it's hanging with the hippies or sipping a blues margarita special, there's plenty to do on the blues trail and plenty to learn, even for someone who's been studying and playing the blues for years. That's the power of the blues and the lure of the blues trail. Thinking all you need is get some brand new eyes. Take another break, a short one, and come on back with the final set. Right here, Reds in Coldwater, Mississippi, on a Friday night. I'm Heather. This is the power of the blues. That's the power of the blues.